um, where there'll be two presenters today, B Security Solutions. That's uh, that's my company. We're we're a, I'm the CEO of eSecurity Solutions, and uh, Zscaler, which everybody probably has heard of. Uh, Rob Chi is going to be presenting for them, and I think it's a really interesting topic. It's super important today, given all the stuff that's going on uh, uh, in the cloud and and the need to increase our security. Um, so this is a slide I put together. Um, actually a couple of years ago, which is interesting because it's, it highlights, I, I, I did a study on, on, on security and security trends and the history, and there were some interesting revelations. Um, first of all, the, the, uh, uh, the security has been, it's, and threats have been evolving since the 1980s uh, with multiple cycles of security solutions um, that uh, where we start with new technologies that are introduced and then we have new attacks that attack the weakest link of uh, within that's been exposed by this new technology. And then we see um, new generation of security solutions designed to fill, you know, to, to address those attacks. And we started with, you, know, you can start with malware and in the old, old days. And then when people were talking about endpoint security as just being antivirus and, and it's evolved over time to address, you know, the internet, um, introduction of the internet, email security, social attacks, um, ultimately through ransomware and things like that. Um, and, and in the last five plus years, we've seen the internet enable cloud infrastructure, cloud applications, and the movement of, of, of the employees to the cloud, which is working remotely at home. And of course, uh, COVID facilitated that in a, in a not so great way. Uh, computing has never been more distributed as a result of all this, and it's hard to defend. Uh, the focus now must shift to protecting of cloud data, cloud systems, and cloud employees, or protecting ourselves from the cloud employees, if you will. Increasingly, security will need to leverage the new paradigms in security to fend off the, the new cloud-based attacks. Now, the old model worked pretty great when everybody was behind the corporate firewall, but that hasn't been true for quite a while. And, um, you know, today the world is different with employees working at home, servers moving to the cloud, app, cloud applications, and the applications basically moved to the cloud, and the cloud data is moving up there to the, to the cloud uh, app servers. So the old model was simple, but it just doesn't work uh, with assets scattered all over the web. And basically, a centralized security doesn't work in a decentralized world. Now, companies have three important focus areas to protect, and there are more that are, that, that are exposed with, you know, with the distributed internet-based uh, uh, cloud uh, and, uh, infrastructure, but uh, three most important ones that I think people are dealing with are the data and servers that are moving to public and private clouds, Amazon web servers and, and, and Microsoft and so forth. The second one is, is the applications moving to to the cloud as well with all the issues related to visibility, the ability to protect the data, the ability to control access and usage. And then lastly, with you know the employees all working from home today, or it, and even today right now, we're looking at about 50% of the employees still working from home. Now the obvious challenges emerge are things like access control, which basically if it's internet-based and it's open to everybody, access control becomes your number one priority, which is hence multi-factor authentication being the, the, the primary solution to that. Um, second thing is how do you control the data and where can it go and how can it be used? I mean, it's not just making sure people can't access it, but how can it be used um, after it's being accessed? And we're talking about employees uh, or third parties. Um, should your employees be able to do whatever they want with the data? that they can access? I mean, that's a serious question that companies have to ask. And lastly, lastly about third parties, right? Uh, third parties could be partners, third parties could be malicious third parties. Uh, they have a much easier job accessing your resources today since all that is reachable by the internet. Um, so is there any other way to look at this other than uh, to not see that new security is required? I mean, it's just that the whole model has changed. Your data is everywhere. Your, your systems are everywhere. If 
we're not doing something about that, I think we're missing the boat. Um, so the question that we have to ask ourselves is this, have we made the type of commitments to protecting the cloud that we did when the PCs were introduced, when networks were introduced, when email was introduced, when the internet was introduced, every one of those introduced another set of attacks and, and threats. Every one of them required another set of security. With everything moving out from centralized into, into uh, a distributed model, we need a secure access service edge instead of a centralized security model. And uh, we need to deploy security that does not care where the assets are, but instead is focused on something that's user centric. We need to protect the users or we're protecting ourselves from the users. So eSecurity Solutions, that's my company. Um, we've continued to adapt our solutions to provide uh, our customers with the ability to assess, define, deploy, and manage their, their security. Um, there are serious focus areas today, such as uh, we probably the biggest one we see is compliance, still driving things. Cyber insurance is a major, major issue today um, and complying with that and being able to get it, if you will, and then actually making sure you're protected if you need to have, uh, you know, if you have to make a claim. Uh, breach protection and response is another big area. Security monitoring and management is a bigger, bigger uh, issue for customers. Um, and that's required by, by all regulations. And of course, zero trust and cloud security is the topic that we're talking about today. So um, we, we are a complete security solution provider and we partner with Zscaler, who is our next presenter. Um, a word about Zscaler, they are, they are the number one cloud and zero trust security solution provider um, in the world. They're, they're at the upper right quadrant of Gartner's Magic uh, Quadrant on, uh, on uh, to, you know, basically cloud security and, and, and security, uh, distributed security model of uh, security uh, uh, access. And, uh, and so basically with that, I want to turn it over to, uh, to Rob to, uh, to give us his view on it and what uh, Zscaler is doing. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, let me just bring up my screen. And um, yeah, so just as an introduction, my name is uh, Rob Chi, as um, Tom graciously introduced me. I am a, at Zscaler, I'm a partner solutions architect, really focusing on public sector part channel partners. But um, if you did have any questions, um, technical questions, definitely reach out to me at rchee at zscaler.com. Um, for any opportunities, definitely reach out to Tom and through him, we can get uh, the right Zscaler resource to be able to help you. But today, what I really wanted to do was just give you the introduction to what is the Zscaler value proposition. There are other, like Tom brought up, the from a Gartner perspective, it's called uh, this whole secure access service edge. And then within that, there's the security stack side of it, the security service edge. And Zscaler is one of the vendors that supports solutions like that, a cloud native solution that allows you to provide security anywhere. But I just wanted to definitely tell you, show you how Zscaler differentiates within that space. And then from that, really give you the introduction to Zscaler in our platform, which is our big differentiator and the solutions as part of that, and then be able to answer your questions at the end. But with that, Tom did a great job of being able to describe, you know, what is the need for this? But what, with that, what is the general architecture when you're talking about zero trust? Generally, it's going to be a zero trust exchange, a internet-based cloud that allows you to be able to allow people, whether they're coming in from individual devices, headquarters, or a branch office, and be able to get access to a, oops, went the wrong way, a cloud-based security stack that really takes into account having strong identity to define who the user is, and from that, from that, also define the device they're coming in on and making sure that device is authorized. Is it a corporate-owned device or is it BYOD? And having that information 
then being able to determine what applications is this user authorized to access, whether it's internet facing applications externally or internal applications. And all the while, while giving access to these authorized applications, making sure that you're looking at the content and making sure one, that sensitive information is not leaving the organization when it shouldn't. And then also that any anything malicious, any malicious software is not making its way back to the end computers. So with this zero trust exchange, the big thing that's important is to have a simplified architecture that allows organizations like yourselves to be able to take advantage of these solutions and have a common policy for users no matter where they are, but make sure you're hitting in all the different security requirements that the users need in order to securely access the internet. Once you do this, you have some general benefits. One, by using an internet facing zero trust exchange, you're providing the most direct path for those end users, no matter where they are, to the applications they need to access, whether those are external or internal. Also, by having you know, that full security stack in the cloud, you're really able to provide high levels of security to mitigate and control risks. And with this scale, the ability to have this in the cloud, so if you have an influx of users, you're able to scale the security stack in the cloud much more easily than if it's an on-premise security stack with appliances, that if they do get overloaded, think about COVID when it first occurred and all of a sudden these, these companies had uh, remote uh, VPN concentrators that now were undersized with the number of users that were coming in from remote locations rather than being in the office. With a cloud-based solution, you're able to scale that out much more quickly. And that's one of the big benefits that Zscaler provided customers at the beginning of COVID, that ability to not have to worry about a small appliance that was undersized for all of the users that were trying to come in, but instead providing a solution that was able to scale and give the end users a good user experience when accessing their mission critical applications. And finally, We'll go into this further as well, but reducing cost and complexity. One security policy that is comprehensive with all of the different features, but then also allowing you to reduce or maybe totally eliminate your security stack and potentially get rid of expensive private links like MPLS links. So this is all the general benefits of a zero trust architecture. When you look at Zscaler and our zero trust exchange, what we're looking at is three big benefits differentiators. One is we are providing zero network access. When you look at like a remote access VPN, you're providing access to an internal network. With Zscaler, what we're doing is we're providing access to just internal authorized applications, really providing micro segmentation to reduce the overexposure that an end user may have to maybe applications that they shouldn't have access to. Also, looking at it from the perspective of the end user's computer is compromised, they're not, the compromiser, the attacker is not able to use that computer to get access to the entire internal network, only the resources that that user was authorized to access. We're also, with our architecture, which I'll go into in the later slides, we are providing zero attack surface, really reducing the risk of attackers compromising maybe like a VPN concentrator or any other exposed IP addresses, and then from there, get access to internal applications. Think about SQL injection attacks, cross-site scripting. We pretty much eliminate that with our architecture. And finally, the zero pass-through connections. So what we are is a, a proxy-based architecture, meaning there is no initial stream of traffic that comes in so you can identify the application and then once that application is identified, then block the traffic. We are not even allowing any traffic to the end users first. We are doing that full proxy, so we're identifying the traffic within our zero trust exchange, validating the application or the what should be allowed, and then only after that has been validated are we then completing that connection to that application, whether it's internet facing or private applications. So a much more secure way of providing access to applications for end users. 
Now, with that, I mean, we talked about like uh, potentially other competitors in this space as well. And why is how is Zscaler different? What makes us the vendor that you should really look at when you're looking at a security service edge or a zero trust solution? The biggest one is that we have the industry's largest inline security cloud. And what that tells you is that whether you're a small organization or a really very large organization, Zscaler has proven that we can scale to the size that you guys are today, as well as any uh, expansion in size that you have tomorrow. In addition to that, what we're saying is we have our, our architecture has already been proven to be able to support 7 billion plus security incidents, 200K plus requests per day, uh, no, 200 billion plus requests per day, which ironically is 18 times, I think 18 times the size of a, the number of Google search requests every day. So we're getting more, we're basically, we're uh, handling more requests than Google receives from search requests every day. So with that also is looking at uh, the ability to say, a lot of customers are using Microsoft 365 today. We have, in each one of these different data centers, we have strategically located them such that they are, on one, on the fastest on-ramp to the internet, the biggest service providers, but then also in the same data centers that support Microsoft 365, giving the fastest access for customers to Microsoft 365 resources. So the end result is, end of the day, not only will you see that we can scale to a large number of users, but we are providing very fast access for end users, no matter what the resource they're trying to access. And we're doing all of this while still meeting the high compliance requirements that you as a customer may be, may be asking for. Everything from SOC 2, FIPS, ITAR, and if you're a SLED or a federal customer, the uh, FedRAMP um, regulation or compliance requirements. So that was all about the scale. Can we scale really big? But one of the other questions may be, all right, well, that's great. You can scale, but what do customers think about you? Do they really see high customer satisfaction with Zscaler as a solution? So this slide really talks to that, where, you know, one, we're being used by over 25% of the global 2000 today. But with that, when you have a SaaS-based application, there's something called a net promoter score, which is really the customer satisfaction for SaaS-based applications. The average score is generally around a 30, but what we have is a net promoter score of 76, showing that customers really are seeing a lot of value from what Zscaler is providing. In addition to that, if you look across the bottom here, what we're seeing is from a general electric perspective, they're seeing 80% faster user experience using Zscaler. Nov, from an energy perspective, is looking few, 35 times fewer infected machines by having a comprehensive policy for users no matter where they are and be able to identify and block threats from uh, accessing those computers. And Siemens, had a, they probably had a lot of private links, but they were seeing a 70% cost reduction when using Zscaler. So hopefully this shows you how Zscaler can scale, but then also great customer experience for what I'm about to show you from the solution perspective. But before we do that, one more slide. When like um, Tom was talking, uh, we definitely, from a Gartner perspective, when you look at that service security service edge Gartner Magic Quadrant, we are like, very top right when you talk about what Gartner thinks of Zscaler as a solution that one can execute, but also has a completeness of vision. So when you're looking at a Zscaler, you're looking at something that has already been proven in the industry, but also from the researchers at like Gartner to, to be one of the top solutions in this space. But having said that, when you're looking at zero trust, there is no one vendor that can do everything. So what we have done is really create very good partner alliance or partnerships with other vendors that are complementary to what Zscaler provides. So when you look at from an identity perspective, we work with uh, Microsoft, with Azure AD, Okta, Ping, SailPoint, uh, as different vendors that provide strong identity to identify the user and provide the right attributes for those users to really provide a granular policy on what that user can access. From an endpoint protection perspective, we provide 
integrations with a large number of endpoint detection and response vendors. Key among those is going to be CrowdStrike, where we have six very, very strong integrations. For example, uh, from a posture perspective, looking at how um, is this end computer in compliance with uh, your security policy, we can take CrowdStrike's score and incorporate that into our policy to say, if this user is trying to access a sensitive application, if their device does not have a CrowdStrike Zero Trust score above a 70, let's say, then they can't access that device. And that, that is dynamically defined. So you're looking at that CrowdStrike score at the moment that, um, what that computer has at that moment. A lot of the, from a security operations standpoint, we have a lot of integrations with the ones you would expect, Splunk, Elastic, Sentinel, so, um, and as well as when you're talking about SD-WAN, if you guys have an SD-WAN vendor, we have integrations, deployment guides, and in fact, with all of these integrations, we have very comprehensive deployment guides on exactly how to configure it. So suffice it to say, if you're looking for a zero trust solution, to simplify really like, get away from your legacy on-premise appliances and really move to something that's going to be flexible and agile to protect your end users no matter where they are, you can do that with Zscaler and the many different partners that we integrate with. But when you look at the differentiator, our, the Zscaler architecture is one of the biggest differentiators in uh, the security service edge space. When you compare it to like an on-premise security stack, you're gonna see the control plane, enforcement plane, and logging plane for each one of these individual vendors, which could be you know, different vendors for each one of these, being individual, siloed, with, where you have to configure each one of these individual. And you may have to size them bigger than you really want to because you have to look at pr uh, providing further future growth. But as you're going to each one of these different appliances, you're gonna have increased latency, inefficiency, because implementing each one of these different vendors in a best practices manner is maybe gonna be beyond your um, security operations capabilities. And keeping them there from a patching perspective, as well as upgrading perspective is going to be a challenge. Now with Zscaler, the big difference here is that we have been built as a cloud native security solution that is really taking the fundamental concepts for cloud security into play. So with that, what does that mean? So it basically means we have a control plane that is separate from our enforcement and logging plane. So with that, as users are growing, we know that the control plane is just somewhere where you, um, the administrators access the admin portal, identity is actually confirmed. So there's, it's very important to control these and protect the control plane, but it does not need to be in as many different places the place where all the traffic is going to be flowing through is going to be the enforcement plane. So we're gonna highly control this control plane and expand it as necessary, but understanding that the enforcement plane is really the place where you have to be able to make sure that you can expand very rapidly based on the number of users. So with this, it's really just Zscaler created uh, commodity servers with uh, SSL inspection cards in them, allowing us to really grow this in these 150 plus data centers as demand increases. And by having the right size number of servers with SSL inspection included, we're really able to provide SSL inspection at scale, meaning very little degradation in performance when users are sending traffic through this enforcement plane. And then once they go through this cloud-based security stack, going to whatever destination they need to go to. But the big thing there is, any on-premise um, security appliance, like a, a fire, a next generation firewall, is going to, as soon as you turn on SSL inspection, the performance is gonna drop in half. With Zscaler, sending traffic through, you're gonna see none of that. You're all, you're gonna see very little degradation of performance, SSL, SSL inspection, which is, you know, really almost mandatory because like 90% plus of traffic today is going to be encrypted. So you're gonna need to be able to see inside of that, do that SSL inspection if you want to, make sure that one, sensitive data is not going out, but then also you're able to see any malicious traffic or file trying to get to the end computers. So that's very important and we do that very well. Finally, from a logging perspective, we're very good at sending logs 
to only the locations and storing them to disk only in the locations where that's authorized. So if any of you have uh, different requirements where you must have logs stored in a certain location to disk, so they're in memory until they get to a certain location, physical location, and only at that point are they actually, or country, and then only at that point are they allowed to be scored as disk, we provide that capability as well. So with that, let's get into it. Like what are these different solutions that Zscaler has that can really, one, simplify your life, but then also do that while providing very high security. And we'll, we'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into these three, um, ZIA, ZPA, and ZDX, but let me give you a high level um, description of them right now. So starting on the top left, Zscaler Internet Access. It's all about protecting user to internet traffic, really moving your security stack, your on-premise security stack to the cloud. So we're providing that full security stack where the users, if they're remote, they would just use our agent called the Zscaler Client Connector, go first hop out to the internet that would get them access to our zero trust exchange, go through that cloud-based security stack, and then from there, go out and get access to whatever internet or SaaS-based resources, internet-facing resources they need to access. But with that, we are providing your next generation firewall, your application awareness, URL categorization, sandboxing, IPS, malware protection, everything that you would really want from a security stack all through one GUI, one paint admin portal, and doing that in a best practices manner. Moving over, we also have user to private applications uh, like VP and think of that as like a VPN alternative with Zscaler private access with the big difference between a remote access VPN and ZPA being that we are providing only access to authorized applications and not an internal network which is traditionally done with a remote access VPN. We also have different ways that I'll go into later that we are able to provide third-party access, clientless access for any BYOD or third-party devices that can't install the client connector and provide the protection that that does. So limited, we can limit down the access for third parties. Just a quick description of the Zscaler cloud protection. What that's all about is protecting your workloads that are in the cloud. So via APIs, um, if you have heard like the CNAP acronym or uh, any cloud-based posture management, that's what we're providing with Zscaler Cloud Protection. Be able to say, all right, you have workloads that are in the cloud. Maybe they're in AWS. Maybe they have an, an S3 bucket storage basically associated with them. And you want to make sure that that storage is not overexposed to the internet, as an example. So with um, Zscaler Cloud Protection, what we're doing is we're saying, we are going via APIs, we're going to be able to, one, monitor that against compliance requirements, against your security policy requirements, and remediate that and close down, down that um, maybe overexposed access if required. So you can see from this, visibility is very important and actionable ways of closing down where security policy or compliance requirements are uh, not being met. So that's all what we do with cloud protection. The last one was all about um, Zscaler digital experience. The user to app experience, really looking at it from the standpoint of, we wanna see the visibility when an end user is having poor performance accessing an application. Think about it this, from this example. You're, um, you open your computer, you bring up YouTube, you're trying to watch a video, but you just see that spinning circle. Why is that? What is causing that spinning circle? What is causing you to not be able to access YouTube could be any number of things. Could be the application. Yeah, for some reason, maybe YouTube is down. Could be your network connection, your access to the internet. Could be something on your computer. What Zscaler Digital Experience does is allows like help desk through one pane of glass to be able to identify exactly where that problem exists at a point in time where you can retrospectively go back 14 days and be able to much more quickly identify an end user's problem by having all that information at their fingertips from an end user computer. Is it the CS uh, really high? Is it their Wi-Fi signal strength that's low? 
or is it their network connection? Are they seeing packet loss of going across the network? Or finally, is it the application itself having problems? And be able to identify that very quickly, increasing the end user's experience because it allows a help desk to be able to identify and solve those problems much more quickly. So with that, uh, just take a little bit of a deeper dive into Zscaler Internet Access. So when you look at Zscaler Internet Access, once again, protecting users to internet uh, protection, moving your security stack into the cloud, there's really four big areas of use cases that we are really showing value. One, when you look at the local internet breakout, that's all about customers that may be having, you have private links or you to connect your branch office to your main office and you're only using internet uh, sporadically. What we're doing with this is everything is all about using the internet as an underlay. So we're just saying, you just provide us any kind of internet to give you access to our zero trust exchange. So it could be 5G, 4G, broadband access, fiber access, any way to get access to the internet that allows you to get access to our zero trust exchange. And then from there, you'll be able to go through our cloud native security stack to protect your traffic and then get access to your ex external applications. So with that, because you just need internet access, it could potentially allow you to get rid of expensive internal MPLS or other private links connecting the different areas. The next is a cyber tech protect threat protection. I brought that up before is really your entire security stack moved into the cloud and provided through one admin portal. One, really truly simplifying the life of the operation staff, but then also allowing you to be able to implement security policies and best practices because it's one security policy that's going to encompass remote users and users in the office. So no longer are you gonna have to have a VPN concentrated with one security policy that you have to somehow figure out how to map this maybe separate vendor to the security policy you have for your on-premise security stack the same, exact same security policy can be dictated for users no matter where they are. But we also have the granularity to say, if you want to be have a more restrictive policy for remote users, we can very easily allow that to um, happen via our access policies as well. Now looking at the workload to internet, what's that about? That's all about IT, IoT or OT devices, devices that basically can't install the client connector or uh, need to be protected no matter where they are and be able to have a method for um, protecting those type of devices. Think of like bad readers, printers, um, industrial devices, and be able to provide access for those to the internet in a secure manner. And finally, when you look at data protection, in addition to that full cybersecurity threat, we're also like providing inline DLP. So as traffic is leaving our client connector or from offices, uh, we have the ability from like a data center or a branch site to uh, actually set up a site-to-site -site VPN using GRE or IPsec tunnels to our zero trust exchange. With that capability, the branch users don't necessarily need to have uh, the client connector on them, but all traffic going through here is actually sent up to the, the our zero trust exchange. But with that, that inline traffic, we are looking at using our DLP dictionaries and engines the ability to identify sensitive traffic and make sure that sensitive traffic does not leave the organization when it shouldn't. On the flip side, we are also providing that for in out of band manner for via CASB to um, be able to provide that same level of protection for users uh, via APIs and out of band uh, DLP or data protection capabilities. So that's all about Zscaler internet access. When you're looking at that and you're looking at the differentiators that Zscaler has with ZIA, one of the big ones is uh, the fact that traditionally on-premise or even like um, some next generation firewalls, you're going to have to go through a series of different engines to be able to identify malicious traffic or make sure that traffic is clean before sending it on its way. With Zscaler, we have something called single scan multi-action, which means that every packet that comes in is individually scanned by each one of our engines at the same time, single scan. 
multi-action. So with that, it's going to decrease the latency and increase the performance because all these engines are running at the same time. And then once it does that, it's sending the traffic on its way. The important thing for you guys is that maybe you're only day one, you're only using URL filtering. And you're like, oh, well, if I turn on IPS, if I turn on DLP at a later date, am I going to see a degradation in performance? Is my traffic going to slow down because now I'm doing further inspections? The answer is no. Whenever we uh, traffic goes through, even if you have not enabled any of these additional engines, those engines are running against your traffic no matter what. So when you turn on those features at a later date, when you are more mature with Zscaler and ready to um, turn on additional, more sophisticated features, there will be no degradation in performance. So you can see where this is very simple for you guys to implement initially and it's, it'll scale and provide very good performance when you get to the sophistication to pin, turn on the majority of the features that Zscaler provides. Now let's look at um, Zscaler Private Access. Once again, Zscaler Private Access was all about user to private applications and protecting those applications that you do not want to expose to the internet at all, your sensitive applications. So with that, what we're really doing is providing that remote access without a VPN, without providing internal network access, but instead providing only access to internal authorized applications. The way that we do that is we have a, the end user having a, the Zscaler client connector. And this one client, our Zscaler client connector, is the same client that is going to be used for ZIA, ZPA, and ZDX. No additional modules, no additional clients that need to be installed, just one client to provide all of the functionality that Zscaler provides. But that client connector is gonna create that, initiate that connection out to the Zero Trust Exchange. Within, let's say, the data center here, we have something called an app connector. It's a virtual machine that is going to exist in the data center or in the cloud right next to where those applications live. That virtual machine is going to initiate a connection out to the Zero Trust Exchange. So that control connection is going to have, this app connector is going to have a lot of advanced functionality in it. It's going to have its policy defined by the central authorities in the, in the cloud to define which applications it needs to support. But it, this app connector is going to then pull out to those applications that it's configured to be able to support and determine the health of those applications. Are those, are those applications up and running? Are they healthy? Should they be receiving requests? So basically when this user makes a request to an application that maybe lives inside this data center, what happens is we create a micro tunnel using these existing connections. This micro tunnel travels through this connection to our zero trust exchange and then goes through this existing connection that's been initiated from the app connector out to the zero trust exchange back through the app connector to those applications. So you can see from this, there is zero attack surface here. There is zero IP addresses listening at the data center because that, initi that connection is initiated from the app connector out and we are just following that, that tunnel, creating a micro tunnel using that existing connection. So that's like our CTO like, has a really good um, catchphrase associated with this. He says, if you're not reachable, you're not breachable. Meaning that if you're not having, don't have any listening IP addresses here, be it, be it a VPN concentrator or be it an IP address of an application, if there's nothing for attackers to try to hit or attack, there's zero attack surface and they're not reachable. Thus, they're not breachable. So higher levels of security with that. Uh, what we're also providing, because everything is via the internet and we are getting giving that access from however you're able to get access to the internet, we are providing that direct app access into the clouds. So what does that mean? That means that we uh, maybe there is a, if you are supporting internal applications, maybe there is that private or site-to-site -site VPN between the data center and your internal applications. You no longer need that. All you need is access to the internet and access to our zero trust exchange that's sitting in the internet. And then from there, be able to create secure connections to your applications, no matter where they live. AWS, Azure, GCP, doesn't matter, as well as your, your on-premise data centers. 
But then one of the things that another um, concept is like, if you have users at headquarters and they have a sensitive application that needs to be accessed with very low latency at very high speeds, traditionally without um, a on-premise solution, these headquarters users would have to go out to the internet hit our zero trust exchange, and then come back in through that app connector into the data center when, when maybe there's already a local area network, a high speed network between the headquarters and this data center. Wouldn't it be much better if these users could use that high speed network and access just access the data center? We provide that with a private service edge, a virtual machine that is hosted by the customer, you guys, and the policy associated with this is still dictated by the central authorities in the cloud, but the data path is going to be through this virtual machine to this applications across this high speed network, providing those customers with low latency, high speed for those sensitive applications in the data center. And finally, we have like third party access. So clientless access, for users that maybe are user using BYOD or maybe uh, perhaps there's a tech support of somebody that needs to access a switch, but the, you know they don't can't install your client connector. What we have is a, a method for via a web browser to provide SSH access, RDP access, or browser-based access. And do that all by going through our zero trust exchange, identifying who they are. Um, in some cases with this, uh, our privileged remote access with uh, SSH and RDP, uh, providing maybe a, a additional justification with an email that's sent with a, a, a token code that they have to enter. And we also have the capability of saying they can only access uh, maybe SSH into a switch during this specific time window, along with that token and providing further levels of security to limit access to maybe a technician or a tech support to be able to access a resource only during a time certain time window and validating who they are and doing that all without you know, via a browser but doing it in a very secure manner so the business value associated with all this is one like i said if you're not reachable you're not breachable eliminating that attack surface and then providing that the most direct access to these private applications. You don't have for like a remote user, they don't have to come all the way into the headquarters where that security stack exists and a VPN concentrator exists and then go all the way back out to maybe an internal application that lives in the cloud. You're providing the most direct access with the highest level of security for those users to access those internal applications and do that in the most direct manner. So lowest latency, best end user experience. So I also wanted to touch on Zscaler digital experience for you guys, that whole user to application experience. So why, why did we create this? Um, Gartner came out with this magic quadrant called the digital experience monitoring. This was all born out of the fact that there were monitoring tools or there still are monitoring tools that looked specifically at the network or specifically at the application or specifically at the endpoint, but they had there was gaps in identifying when maybe the network and the endpoint were having problems and, and making that linkage into what exactly the problem was. So this whole digital experience monitoring category is looking at all three of these different areas from an end user's perspective, accessing a particular application and providing the exact spot where that problem exists. And then maybe from there, like maybe it's an application problem um, and you can identify that as the problem being on the application and using more of an application monitoring tool to then dig, dig in and see exactly why that problem existed on the application. Digital experience monitoring tools are really just to identify where the problem is, allowing the help desk or a, a higher level person to be able to fix the problem from there. So what are we doing? We are looking at, and this is all relying on our client connector you sending probes up to applications that have been configured, the applications that you really are, are of high priority to you as a customer. And looking at three components to a score, one, the application performance, next, the network performance, the network path, number of hops, packet loss, things like that, and then the endpoint health, memory, CPU, Wi-Fi signal strength, the battery, the disk, making and seeing what the status of those different components are when a user is accessing a particular application and giving a digital experience score associated with that. 
from there, or before I get into from there, I'm basically, how easy is this to actually implement? Because the last thing you want is like, all right, well, I've got ZIA, I've got ZPA, now I have to go through this entire new process to implement ZDX. That is not the case. It is literally five minutes to get this configured and running if you are an existing ZIA, ZPA customer. So basically, like I said earlier, this all relies on the client connector being on all the computers. If you're a ZIA customer today, or if, if you are start with ZIA, you've got this client connector on all your end computers. All that's required is to enable the ZDX functionality through uh, the ser service entitlement through our client connector or agent portal, and then configure which applications you want to actually have supported. From there, there's no, when the uh, client connector is accessing this application, it's really just trying to hit that application on the port that it is um, authorized, I mean, it, it runs on, and validate that that's up and running from that perspective. So there's no additional credentials or anything that need to be installed on those um, application for those application servers um, and this can be basically up and running in five minutes providing you telemetry based on the user's performance accessing those applications even when they're not using it it's just sending those probes out every 15 minutes the one difference there is that we also support microsoft teams and zoom so you, when you're looking at why a particular user may be having a pro, um, you know, slow performance when they're on a call we have specific um, API integration with uh, Zoom and Microsoft Teams, such that we can see the call quality, see the performance of that um, actually that meeting outside of the, the telemetry tree with the um, user application and network. So we're actually able to see much more granular detail to be, help you identify exactly why maybe on a Zoom call some users have, are having poor performance and identify that and fix that much more quickly. So, I mean, there's basically two ways that we're providing this, uh, the benefit with ZDX. One is a, a reactive measure where we're able to reduce the mean time to remediate issues when users call into the help desk. So, as you can see here, we're basically saying the level one will now be able to use a ZDX GUI to be able to identify some issues that they weren't able to before. Level two is be based on this visibility, being able to see, was it these, um, a particular ISP that's having an outage? Was it like the Wi-Fi signal strength on the end user that's causing a problem or high CPU? They're able to answer a lot more tickets without having to escalate to level three, where level three is really then able to only have to worry about the high level cases that really should be escalated to them. From a proactive perspective, when you look at ZDX and providing that visibility into the end user's experience accessing applications, we have alerts. So with those alerts, you can see are a, a number of different users in a particular region seeing high CPU on their computers. Maybe a Microsoft update went out when it shouldn't have gone out and is causing uh, high CPU utilization. When the help desk receives that alert, they can like look at that region, see what's happening, and be able to stop that maybe a Microsoft update from being sent off to additional computers and do that proactively without having any users call into the help desk at all. So you can see there from there with these alerts, you're really able to get that visibility and get ahead of problems before they become too large. So with that, I mean, we, we really talked about ZIA, ZPA, ZDX, and a little bit on cloud protection. We really wanted to um, bring it all together through this diagram to show where and how each one of these can show benefit for you. So really, across the network, we have ZIA and ZPA. Once again, ZIA for protecting your access to internet-facing applications, SaaS applications, whereas Zscaler Private Access is all about protecting your internal applications all built on having strong identity with either a SAML 2.0 provider and potentially with SKIM that's able to send to the attributes associated with uh, the SAML providers uh, much more quickly. But then from a Zscaler private access, putting that virtual machine, that app connector at the locations where those app applications live and on the end computers, installing that Zscaler client connector. Once again, that client connector is going to be the client that is going to work for ZIA, ZPA, and ZDX, just one client to do all of that. And do that 
with um, multi-factor authentication, like Tom brought up, do that with uh, high levels of authorization from your identity, and use that identity and the client connector to send traffic through ZIA and ZPA to from and from a ZIA perspective, have your security stack in the cloud and be able to provide all of that SSL inspection and that full security stack protection in the cloud prior to getting giving access to internet facing applications. And then from a API perspective with ZIA, we're pro also providing out of band data protection for data at rest DLP malware and malware production. And then from a private access, you know, that VPN alternative, looking at the user, the device they're coming in on and through integrations with EDR vendors to be able to identify the, the policy and whether it is at a high enough level to allow access to sensitive applications. And then from there, only give access to authorized applications while looking at sensitive data from a DLP perspective, as well as malicious content and making sure that that is uh, identified and allowed right, from a sensitive information allowed, but from a malware protection perspective, um, blocked. And doing this all, so we're, we're handling your internet facing traffic, your private applications, and doing that all while providing logging to allow analysts to investigate both um, within the tools themselves, so we, we host uh, the logs for six months for ZIA and 14 days for ZPA, but also having the ability to be able to send those to your SIM or your SOAR tool and allowing analysts to investigate natively uh, there as well. So with this, hopefully I've been able to show that you know, Zscaler is very full featured, but we do it in a way that is simplified and allows you, no matter what the size of your organization, to really take advantage of this in a flexible manner to support your users no matter where they are. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to, uh, to you, Tom. Yep, thanks very much. That's um, A, really interesting, B, complicated. <laughs> Maybe yeah, for me, of course, I'm, you know, I'm not technical as I used to be, but, um, but actually I love that last slide because that last slide really pulled it all together well. Um, this is a good time for us to, if you have any questions, enter it into the questions box on your, on your console. Um, when, Rebecca, I want to remind you that we've got a JBL go to speaker, go to speaker system that is going to be given away uh, after the event. We'll let you know. Uh, as we pull that randomly out afterwards. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, so uh, while we're waiting for you guys to answer, to enter some questions, um, I mean, so my, I would have a question. I mean, my, from my point of view, the way, if I was one of you, one of the companies, you know, on the call today, I would, I would say, gee, these are the things that I'm concerned about. Um, can we talk about that? And can we get uh, a more specific, presentation around around how you solve that problem and i'm assuming the answer to that rob is yes yeah definitely and then like to the complexity um comment i mean we really uh what we do from a, a pre-sales perspective before you guys even like do any kind of deployment we create for you uh, what's called a transformation roadmap we look at what are your high priority use cases and we look at where your sophistication is from a operation perspective and we give you a map for implementing the different features that Zscaler provides over time as you're able to consume that and based on your users as well, how fast are they able to maybe get that client connector installed? And also importantly, we look at it from a financial perspective, from a economic buyer and which what they wanna know is how fast can I get these on-premise appliances out of here? How fast can I actually start saving money with Zscaler? We provide that visibility as well. And when time-wise, that economic buyer is going to be able to say, yes, I can uh, see where Zscaler is providing a return on investment. Okay, so we do have a question from Robert. Um, can you define the typical customer size, demographic, uh, et cetera? So from us, I mean, for I mean, we're a cloud native solution. So really, there is nothing like a minimum, what, I think uh, like the minimum is gonna be like a uh, hundred users or something like that. So, but 
basically you're just taking advantage of our zero trust exchange, our infrastructure that already exists in the cloud. Think of it from like a, you know, a cloud provider perspective, where this AWS, but we'll just use AWS as an example. Uh, you can be an extremely small organization and be able to take advantage of the wealth of building tools like Kubernetes or containers and compute engines in, in the cloud, virtual machines in the cloud. Same thing is true of Zscaler. We already have all that infrastructure in place. All you have to do is take advantage of that, even if you are a really small organization, all the way up to a very large organization. And what we have from a licensing perspective is different additions. So we have this essentials edition. If you're just getting started, you just want the basics. Through a business edition, as you're growing and need more capabilities and transformation edition, where you're you know, really mature and you want the full set of features that Zscaler provides. And finally, like an ELA edition, which you, you know, you get the whole kitchen sink. So if you're a small organization that's just getting started, you can look at the addition that you want and match that up to your capabilities or your, your pain points. But um, from our perspective, we do have a very well-defined strategy or um, sales process that makes sure that we un uncover what your pain points are, what your existing network looks like, and then map that to Zscaler solutions that can provide a solution to those business requirements and pain points, and then provide you with a 2B diagram that shows you exactly where you will end up, as well as, like I was saying, that transformation roadmap that tells you how to get there over a time period that makes sense for your organization. So, you know, basically, it doesn't have to be a gigantic organization, it can be a very small organization, and still see the value of what Zscaler can provide. Okay, so then as a closing statement here, um, what we, uh, the security solutions, uh, uh, salespeople are the people that can work with you, reach, reach out to them, or we'll try to reach out to you and, and figure out what kind of discussion makes sense to, as a follow on. And uh, we'll see, you know, if, if there's something that can be, uh, that, that, that can be defined that works well for your specific organization. With the one thing that's very clear is that the, the world has changed, this problem has changed, and using traditional security isn't going to cut it in the long term. So uh, I, it seems like the right time to start migrating to these kinds of solutions as as quickly as, as makes sense for you, um, since the, the ability to protect your company appropriately with the new uh, environment that we live in is just not possible without that. Uh, so thank you all for attending. We're going to wrap up now because to respect your time and um, look forward to you attending the next presentation. We have one on April 11th on managed security and managed SIM SOC and, and how managing overall security monitoring is important for companies. And we'll talk about that comparing to XDR and things like that. So um, please sign up for that. It should be fun and look forward to seeing you the next time. Thanks very much.